This has been Radiant News. Good morning, Radiant family. How's everybody doing? Can we just take a moment and welcome our online family and our Portage family? Come on, let's put our hands together. Welcome you guys. We love you. Glad you're here. Uh, real quickly, I know we've said it a few times, but reinforcement. So next weekend with it being Easter, I want to just challenge you to do a couple things. If Radiant is home uh, and you come regularly, number one is we're going to ask you to pray. Pray this week that we'll make much of Jesus in both here and at every church in our community. Uh, it, we want every church to be absolutely packed out with people celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, right? Uh, so pray that and pray also about who God would lead you to invite to come with you to church next weekend for one of our Easter services. 80% of unchurched people, people who don't go to church or used to go to church and have stopped, don't know the Lord, all of those categories, 80% of them will go to church if they are invited by somebody who will go with them. So that's up to us. This is part of, this is the easy part of evangelism, of just saying, you know, being friendly, being nice, and inviting someone to come with you. When you're at a restaurant and you leave a tip, leave an invite card. Leave a really good tip and then leave an invite card. Or text somebody, call somebody, send somebody a link from Facebook or Instagram and invite them to come with you to Easter. And then here's the other thing is, it doesn't matter which campus you're at, uh, we have added some services. So especially the Richland folks, uh, that 1030 service is going to be like this. It's gonna just be packed in standing room only. So we need to divide the Red Sea. We need some of you to sleep in a little bit later, come to 1230. I know it's a lot to ask. Here's what you can just be like, you know, I'm a missionary, I'm sleeping in till noon, just doing it for the Lord. Uh, or you can like get up early like Jesus did <laughs> and come to the 8.30 service. That would be fantastic. Or, or try this out, uh, both at Portage and at Richland, if you've ever wanted to go check out our Portage campus, Portage, we have a Saturday night Easter service along with our Saturday night here. So go on over there to one of the Saturday nights or come here Saturday night. That will really help us. Last year, just to give you an idea, we had about 7,000 people in church. Uh, for Easter, and so we're probably expecting that or even more than that, so we're just trying to make room for everybody, so your help is greatly appreciated. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles this morning, wherever you're at, to Matthew chapter 21. And while you're turning there, let me just highlight a couple things that are coming up the next few weeks uh, that are going to be uh, things you're going to want to know uh, here at Radiant. Next weekend, obviously, is Easter. The weekend after Easter... Uh, I will be uh, introducing to you my new book. It's called Flourish. And it, you, we're not going public with it. It's not gonna be on Amazon or sold in bookstores. We wanna release it to Radiant Church first because it's our story. So the book is called Flourish, Planting Your Life Where God Designed It to, to Thrive. And uh, we're gonna have it here. That's, so it's gonna be Flourish Weekend. That's the following weekend. Then after that, on May, uh, let's see, May 4th or May 3rd, third and fourth uh, that weekend, we are going to start for the next three weeks Red Hot. How many remember Red Hot? Okay, so it's live. Uh, text in questions and answers. Any of your questions about family and relationships, about Bible and theology, the last week will be wild card where you can ask anything about anything. Live on the spot, put the pastor on the spot. I'll see the question when it comes up on the screen at the exact same time everybody sees it and I'm gonna do my best to not sweat like Mike Tyson at a spelling bee and answer <laughs> the question according to the Bible. So that red hot is coming and then we're gonna be launching our summer series called Heroes, New Testament Edition. So there's some good stuff coming down the pike. All right, Matthew chapter 21. Look with me here at verse number one. It says, now when they, that's Jesus and his disciples, when they drew near to Jerusalem and they came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them. And then they will send them at once. This took place to fulfill which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden." 
The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Verse 12, and Jesus entered the temple and he drove out all who sold and bought in the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it into a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what they are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise. I've entitled this message this morning, A Strange Way to Save the World. A strange way to save the world. Today is the day when we commemorate Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. This is the story that we just read. It's the beginning of Passover week. It's the beginning of what for Jesus will be his Passion Week. We know that in the next several days as Jesus enters the city, that Jesus will appear in the temple almost daily. And the reason why that's significant is Jesus comes as the ultimate Passover lamb. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that Jesus is our Passover lamb. He's the fulfillment of all the types and all the shadows that in the Passover meal the lamb represented. The lamb was the spotless lamb. The lamb needed to be investigated. It needed to be inspected by the priest before it could be offered as a sacrifice. So Jesus, as the Passover lamb, enters into the city and he appears in the temple daily to be inspected, to be questioned to be interrogated, to prove that they could find nothing in Jesus. During this week, Holy Week or Passion Week, Jesus will spend one last evening with his disciples, the Last Supper. And he'll take the Passover meal together with his disciples. And at the end of it, he'll institute a new covenant. And he'll take the bread and he'll say, this is my body. He'll take the cup and he says, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Remember me. Jesus will in this week go to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives and he will pray one last time, God, if there's any other way. Let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And that same evening, Jesus will be arrested. Illegally tried. He'll stand before Pilate. He'll stand before the Sanhedrin council. And the order will be given for Jesus to be scourged, for him to be beaten, and for him to be crucified. You see, this week on Friday... Jesus will be forced to carry his own cross after experiencing scourging with a cat of nine tails. In a weakened form, a man named Simon of Cyrene will be forced to carry his cross and take it to a place called Golgotha outside the city walls of Jerusalem. And Jesus, the son of the living God, will allow his hands to be nailed to the cross beams and his feet. After a crown of thorns has been crammed down onto his head and after He's been beaten severely. Jesus will be lifted up in humiliation and agony, in excruciating pain for six hours on the cross to die for the sins of the world. And Jesus will give up his spirit into the hands of the Father. And all day Saturday, Jesus will remain in the tomb. But on Sunday, an angel will roll the stone away. 
And the son of the living God will be resurrected from the dead. And he will have the keys of death, hell, and the grave in his hands forevermore. And he will rise from death victorious, an overcomer, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. And he will have made a way for each and every one of us to be saved and to be right with God. Praise the Lord. Jesus is a lot. This, this is the week. And how it begins, though, Jesus has spent several weeks making the journey from Galilee in the north down to Jerusalem in the south. In fact, I think we have a map here that charts out the journey of Jesus from the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, along the well-tread trail all the way down to Jerusalem. And as he enters into the city of Jerusalem, one last time, he has just left Jericho. Jericho was further to the east. It was his last stop. And from Jericho to Jerusalem, it's 14 miles of climbing, almost 3,000 foot of elevation change. It wasn't the easiest way to get to Jerusalem, but it was Jesus' chosen way. And the reason why it was chosen is because Jesus was making a messianic declaration. Jericho was significant. How many know that Jericho was the place where Joshua fought the battle of? And the walls, what did they do? That's right. See, it was the first city that Israel conquered as they entered into the promised land. It was the first. Do you know what the last was? It was Jerusalem. David conquered it and ushered, and ushered in the golden era of David. And if you notice the cries of the crowd, they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is the son of David. So the Messiah, the, the messianic figure that Israel was anticipating who would come, who would forgive, who would heal, who would restore the golden era of Israel, who would restore the kingdom and fulfill the promises that God had made to Israel through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they called the Messiah the son of David. So as Jesus goes from Jericho to Jerusalem, he's making a prophetic statement that God has begun the work of salvation at Jericho and now he's about to finish it in Jerusalem. And now as Jesus comes with his disciples and they're climbing up the trail towards Jerusalem and they come to the Mount of Olives, the easternmost border of the city of Jerusalem, and they climb up Mount of Olives and they're looking down into the Kidron Valley at the Temple Mount, the disciples know that this is a significant moment. The crowds come and they've been following Jesus for quite a while, many of them all the way from Galilee. Many of them kind of figured out what was about to happen. They were living in Jericho and they said, oh, we heard word that Jesus is going into Jerusalem. Jesus was not just making a trip to Jerusalem. Jesus was going to Jerusalem on purpose. And everybody knew that this He's the Messiah. He's going to Jerusalem on Passover week. This is the day. This is it. This is, this is the countdown. This is the countdown to Messiah restoring Israel. This is the countdown to God saving us, rescuing us from our oppressors. This is the moment where the Messiah, the son of David, is going to come. He's going to walk into Jerusalem. He's going to sit down on the throne like David, and he's going to restore the kingdom. In fact, they knew it because it's quoted in Matthew 21 where it says that he came in on a donkey. And the reason why he came in on a donkey is because Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 says, Behold, daughters of Zion, when your Messiah, your king, comes, he will come lowly and humble, riding in on a donkey. Everybody knew that. And Jesus knew that. The disciples knew that. That's why he did it. They knew the prophetic symbolism. So when Jesus said, hey, go get me a donkey, they're just like, oh, this is good. I mean, if somebody told you, hey, by the way, I'm about to go for a walk, can you go grab me a donkey? It probably wouldn't have the same meaning for you. It's like, what do you want a donkey for? It's like, donkey? How about a quad? No, donkey. I need, a, I need a donkey. They knew what Jesus was doing. But listen, they also knew what verse 10 said in Zechariah, verse 9 and 10, chapter 9. It says, and not only will he come humble in on a donkey, but when he comes, he will break the bow. He will put away war. He will make peace with all the nations and he will establish the kingdom from the great sea all the way to the Euphrates River. 
They would not have segmented it into just the first part. They would have seen the second part of the messianic promise as well. That's why they're shouting, Hosanna! How many grew up going to church on Palm Sunday? You got one of these. Like, grew up doing that? I did. I went to United Methodist Church, and we always got one. I didn't know what they were for. I just knew I could smack my friend on the back of the head with it. We'd get them and just, Hosanna! We're waving and chanting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's a, Hosanna is actually a word that comes from the Hebrew. It's the Hebrew transliteration. The real word is Hoshana, Hoshana. And it means victory, salvation, now. Think about that. Literally, when they were throwing down their palm branches for Jesus to walk on and they're shouting, to Jesus, Hoshana! I mean, the crowds are gathering, right? They're swelling. And, and Jerusalem would have been crowded because it's Passover. People from every nation, all over the world, Jews would have gathered for Passover, for pilgrimage, and, and they're shouting, Yeshana! Here's what they, it, it might as, they might as well have been playing. It's final countdown. Remember the bulls when they would come out? championships, and they would, and now, your Chicago Bulls. I love that. <laughs> I always want to do that in church. But that's, it might as well have done that for Jesus, because when they're waving and saying, Hosanna, they're not just saying, oh, this is fun to do. They're saying, no, this is victory. You see, the palm branch was a symbol in Israel of Israel's ultimate messianic victory. Actually, if you go back in history and you look at coins that were minted in the days of Jesus and after Jesus, they would have palm branches on them because it was their declaration, we will be victorious. It was messianic. It wasn't just, we're gonna win. It's when God acts in history, when God acts on our behalf in history, uh, we're gonna win. And not only are we gonna win, but the Messiah is gonna come. And when the Messiah comes, all of our problems are gonna go away. He's going to take the throne of his father, David. And he's gonna restore our borders. He's gonna restore our dignity. God is going to forgive our sins. He's gonna usher in the world to come. And they thought all of that was happening all right then. That's why they're shouting Hosanna to Jesus. And Jesus was on his way into the city to bring the kingdom of God, to save his people, to overthrow their oppressors, to bring victory and to bring salvation. It just wasn't going to be the way they all thought it was going to be. You see, they thought when Jesus comes, victory, or when the Messiah comes, victory would come by him defeating all of their enemies. But what they didn't realize is that their greatest enemy was not an enemy around them or against them, but it was the enemy within them. You see, remember that those scriptures that we like to quote, like Isaiah chapter 54, where it says, no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. How many have ever remember that verse? It's like, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against you in accusation, you shall condemn. I mean, we love those verses. Whenever we're under attack, but what do you do when the weapon that's formed against you is actually formed within you? What do you do when the tongue that rises in accusation against you is actually your own tongue, self-condemning you by your very own words? What do you do when instead of the greatest threat against your salvation and against your eternal life and against your future is not the devil, it's not the person that you view as your enemy, it's actually you. You are carrying around death on the inside of you. That's what they did not comprehend. That's what Jesus absolutely knew. He knew as he came into the city of Jerusalem, he was going to take his seat on a throne, but it was not the throne that they all thought he was gonna take. His throne was gonna be a cross, you see, there will come a day that as, as followers of Jesus, what we believe and what the Bible teaches very clearly now on the other side of the cross and the resurrection 
is that Jesus's, the Messiah's coming would be divided into two parts. The first part was he was gonna come as a humble servant who would die upon a cross as a suffering servant that God would vindicate by raising them from the dead. And that would bring about salvation of our sins and freedom from spiritual bondage and oppression so that we could have a relationship with God because that was our real enemy. But there would also come a time when that same Jesus, remember Acts chapter one, the angel announces to the disciples, this same Jesus whom you see depart will in likewise return. There is coming a day when Jesus, the son of David, is going to pierce the eastern sky. He's gonna return in physical, visible form. All those who pierced him shall see him. All nations shall weep for him and his feet will touch the Mount of Olives and he will march through the eastern gate and he will sit on the throne of his father David and he will rule forever and ever as King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is coming again. He will fulfill verse 10 of Zechariah chapter nine. He will do it. But they thought it was all gonna happen right then. And here was the biggest, biggest issue is they all thought that salvation or victory meant God dealing with their oppressors and their enemies and they didn't realize they were their worst enemy. Because they, like us, are radioactive. We're radioactive with sin. Sin from the inside out, that's our biggest enemy. That's why in Mark chapter seven, Jesus said this. He said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of a man. In other words, the source of everything that's defiling and everything that's wrong and everything that's corrupt actually comes from inside of us. We think the opposite. We think all the things that are wrong in our lives are the result of other things, other enemies. But you know, Romans says that the wages of sin is death. How many have ever sinned? (laughs) If you didn't raise your hand, that was your first one. (laughs) Welcome to the club. Jesus said in, John, in Mark chapter seven, he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For within, out of the heart of man comes evil thoughts. Anybody ever had an evil thought? Raise your hand. <laughs> One person's like, my aunt raising my hand. Yeah, that's evil. Okay. <laughs> Sexual immorality, don't raise your hand. <laughs> Theft, anybody ever stolen anything? Stole somebody's seat this morning? Murder, adultery, coveting, wanting what other people have, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander. You ever said anything bad about somebody else? Pride, (laughs) none of us. (laughs) Foolishness, all, listen to Jesus, all these evil things come from within and they defile a person. See, the real issue, I know that we have enemies. I know that there are things that are external that are challenges and obstacles. I know that there is a devil. I think sometimes we give the devil far too much credit for the havoc that's in our life when he really doesn't need to do much because we're pretty good at making a jacked up mess of our own lives. But what Jesus realized is the only way to save the world was for him to become one of us and to take our place and suffer the penalty of sin, which is death. Jesus, the only one who was sinless, the only one, the only man who's ever lived and never sinned, not once. The innocent became guilty for us so that you and I, the guilty, could be, call, could be called and declared innocent by God. Romans 8 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It's the gift of God. And Jesus knew that. And that's why he had his face set like flint as he entered into the city. As he entered into Jerusalem. And while they're all shouting, Hosanna, victory, salvation, it's now. Jesus said, yeah, absolutely. They just didn't know how it was going to go down. They had misconceptions. And what's interesting is the very same crowds that were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, were the same crowd that about five days later were shouting, crucify him. Why? It's because their expectations were not met. 
Their expectations were not met. This isn't how you're supposed to save the world, Jesus. You don't go to the cross and give up. We want a, we want a warrior. We want a conqueror. We want somebody who's going to be bombastic and wield a sword. We, we don't want a suffering servant who gets killed. Rome is evil. Rome is our enemy, and you're submitting to them, and they're, they're watching the Romans kill their hopes and their dreams. The disciples go back to fishing because they thought it was all over until Jesus rose. And so unmet expectations, unmet expectations create disappointment, and disappointment creates bitterness, and bitterness hardens our heart towards God. So many people that day had unmet expectations. Jesus was not cooperating with their plan, but he was cooperating with God's plan. And he'd come to save the world, but he was going to do it in a strange way, all the way to the cross. But it didn't start with the cross. It started with Jesus in his triumphal entry into the city. And immediately he goes up into the temple, the house of God, and he overthrows tables, money changers, those who were corrupt lawyers and Pharisees that were kind of religious leaders. That basically they said, look, if you want access to worship God, you gotta go through us and you're gonna have to use temple money. Temple money was kind of like if you wanted to buy an animal to sacrifice, you couldn't use your money, you had to use temple money and temple money had a usury charge. So if it's like, well, you can buy a pigeon to offer to God to fulfill what Leviticus says is necessary for your guilt offering. And you wanna be right with God, but you gotta go through me and I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. A pigeon costs $10. Oh, let me, let me pay that out. And they said, no, 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 not, 10, not $10 of your money, $10 of temple money. Well, I've got $10, give me $10 of temple money. You know, that costs $50. Well, I can't afford $50. Then I guess you can't be forgiven. It's kind of like the guys on Christian television who oftentimes will say, you can have a miracle for a gift of $599. I thought it was freely you've received, therefore freely give. I didn't know there's a price tag attached to the grace of God. You see, not only were they charging usury, but they were also creating barriers by legal details saying you can't worship God unless you have my help. It was, they were a symbol of a legalistic system that kept people at an arm's length away from God. That's why when Jesus walked into the temple, he threw them over. Man, that just must have felt good. Look in there, just walk into there. Throw that, get out of my way, you've made my house a den of robbers. I want it to be a house of prayer for everybody. And it says, immediately the blind and the lame came to Jesus. Why is that significant? Because blind people and lame people weren't allowed in the temple. They were unclean. But now they begin to hear, hey, Jesus is in town. And wherever Jesus is, miracles happen. And so they rushed the temple. Hosanna, I'm blind, son of David, heal me. Jesus heals them. Lame people are brought in. Lame people can't walk, which means somebody had to carry them in. Somehow, someway, they had to get in there. And so they're carrying their lame people and they're bringing them up in the middle of all these crowds of religious people and tables turned over and coins flying everywhere. Jesus is making a mess. And Jesus heals the lame people and they're walking. Children's choir over to the right begins to shout, Hosanna! And the religious leaders are freaking out because religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, here's what they're experts at. They are experts at creating legalism, legalistic, law-centered, performance-oriented ladders that people have to climb in order to get to God. But Jesus had climbed down the ladder of heaven, come as one of us to all of us to heal any of us who would come to him. And Jesus stands in the temple. Hosanna. Now listen, here's what I want to tell you is that Jesus came in a strange way to save the world when he entered into the city. And in the same strange way, Jesus saves us individually. You see, oftentimes we think the things that are keeping us back from walking in joy and happiness and fulfillment in life are external things. We think, if God would just do this, 
it would change everything. If, if God would, listen, if God would defeat ISIS in the Middle East, we would have peace and safety and we could go back to life before as it was. If God would just defeat all the terrorism that's out there, and it's a real threat, but can I tell you? You change the external, we still have an internal issue. How many know that even people that are far away from Christ, that are in ice, here's the hard thing to wrap your mind around about Jesus, that when Jesus was on the cross, he wasn't just dying for white American folks. He was dying for Al-Qaeda and ISIS. He was dying for communists. Believe this or not, he was dying for Republicans. And Jesus was dying for Democrats. He was dying for rich people. Jesus was dying for poor people. Jesus was dying for popular people. Jesus was dying for obscure people. Jesus was dying, John 3, 16 was to say, for God so loved the world. It's everybody. But we oftentimes make enemies the battlefield where salvation is waged. We think, God, if you love me, you'll defeat my enemies. That's when I'll, I'll be really happy. If you defeat the person on the other side of the aisle, then salvation will come to our nation. It'll come to me. Or we think, God, if I could just, if I could just have that right relationship, man. I mean, I'm lonely. I'm single. I'm like 31 years old and still waiting for that right one. I've been on Christian Mingle and Christian Tingle and eHarmony and farmer's dating website, and I'm just looking for that, right? I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, I'm liking, I'm communicating, and I just can't find that right one. Lord, when that right one comes, then my life will be complete. I will have found my La Fonda, my soulmate. <laughs> we think it's external, but if you can't be the right one, you'll never find the right one. See, that's why I tell young people, instead of you searching for the right one, how about work on becoming the right one so when you find the right one, they'll recognize you. Mm. Or, hey, God, if you just took care of my financial issues, my problems, man, I mean, my life would be set. I mean, the only issues I have are financial. But can I just tell you that money is just like miracle grow. Whatever you put it on, it will just make it more. So if you add miracle grow to sin, it'll just expand that. If you give money to a corrupt, radioactive individual, money will just make you more of who you already were. Money doesn't solve problems. Now, money can do a lot of good. Money can do a lot of bad. Do you know I heard that over 90% of the, I can't remember, 90% of the $20 bills in the U.S. have traces of cocaine on them. I don't even know if that's true. I heard it. I, 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 actually, I read it on the interweb. <laughs> so it's got to be true. But listen, the point is this. The problems that we have are not external. The things that Jesus comes to save us from are not external. You see, Jesus entered into the temple in a very strange way to begin saving the world. But today he doesn't enter temples. Today he enters our lives. And when he comes into our life, what does he do? Does he immediately deal with our enemies' issues? Does he deal with the spouse we're married to? Does he deal with their issues? Now, when Jesus enters into our life, what does he do? He starts overthrowing tables. Overthrowing areas of our life where there's corruption. Overthrowing areas of our life where we've allowed legalism to set in, where we've created self-constructed belief systems or patterns of behavior that others have told us, if you'll do these things, you'll be right with God. If you just act like this, then you can, you'll be right with God. If you do that, that's really bad. If you don't do this, you know, smoke and drink, that's bad. But lie and cheat on your taxes, everybody does that. We have legalism. In Jesus' day, under the old Jewish dispensation, there were 613 laws in the Old Testament that nobody could keep. Nobody kept them all. If you broke one, you broke them all. 
The law was never meant, listen, the law of Moses was never given by God in order for it to be a means of salvation. He didn't send Jesus because it was too complicated and we couldn't figure out. The law was actually given by God to convince us that we did not have it within ourselves to save ourselves by our good behavior. He gave us the law to expose to us our drastic need of him to come and to save us from the inside out. So what does Jesus do? He shows up in our lives. And instead of giving us a better set of rules and say, here's your 10, do these things and you'll be right with me. No, Jesus comes and he starts overthrowing tables. No, that belief system, you think you can improve yourself, your best form of yourself, focus on yourself. All, uh, that's all garbage. And I'm gonna, th I'm gonna just turn these tables over right now because your heart was never meant to be a religious institution of performance unto God. Your heart was meant to be the holy of holies where you and your father have an intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship. And then what does he do? Well, Jesus, somebody was about to clap and that would have made me feel really good, but you were just <laughs> tenth of a second too late, so. It's all right, but I forgive you. No, I forgive you. <laughs> no, it's all right, it's grace. It's grace. It's just grace. Then what does Jesus do? The blind and the lame come to him. And did Jesus tell him, you don't belong here? You got what you deserve? Jesus heals him. I want you to know that you may have 20-20 sight. But all of us start our journey with Jesus being healed from spiritual blindness. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. When Jesus finds us, we're all spiritually blind. I don't know about you, but when I look back on my life before Jesus, the words of amazing grace, I was once blind, but now I see. Have you ever thought to yourself, how in the world did I not see this? How in the world was I seeing the world? I was, I was, I was blind to the gospel. I was blind to who Jesus was. The disciples were blind to how Jesus came to save the world. It wasn't until the resurrection that their eyes opened. You know, the beautiful thing about Jesus is when he saves us, he doesn't come to make us a better version of ourselves. He comes to make the dead soul on the inside of us alive in him. And he heals us in the places where we're lame, where we're broken, where we were fine, but something happened, trauma happened in our lives and we find ourselves broken, unable to walk, unable to follow him. You can't follow Jesus if you can't walk. Jesus doesn't walk away from us and say, I guess you can't. He reaches down to everyone who said, listen to me, this is for somebody this morning. You've thought for a long time, I just don't have what it takes to follow Jesus. I've tried, and you've looked at your life and said, I'm just not cut out for it because spiritually you've been lame. I want you to know that in the name of Jesus today, he reaches down and he says, you don't have it in your own strength, but today I'm gonna heal your heart and give you the ability to follow me. Rise up, take up your mat and follow me. And lastly, what's the last thing that Jesus does? It says that the Pharisees and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, saying, Hosanna, son of David. The kids, the kids see what Jesus is doing. And how many know kids, they're gonna have a party no matter what. And they're singing. Son of David, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, kids, when they sing, they sing without constraint. They sing the top of their voice, even if they don't sound good. You ever notice that? We sing really. <clears throat> oh, oh, no, wrong key. Uh, mm, and we try and make it perfect, and we don't, we don't reach for the high notes. Unless you're Corey Asbury or Richard Adolph or somebody like that. You know, you're, yeah, all those. All those. We don't reach for those high notes. Kids do. They just go for it. Why? It's because there's a childlike innocence. Jesus says, 
to the scribes and the Pharisees, he says, have you not read that God perfects praise in the mouths of infants and nursing babes? You know what he's talking about? When Jesus comes into our life to save us, he heals us, he overthrows all of our old mindsets, picks us up and gives us the ability to follow him, and he puts in our heart a brand new song, a song of gratitude, of childlike faith, not of cynicism, jadedness, skepticism. He gives us something on the inside of us where we don't care what anybody else thinks. We're gonna reach for the high notes of praise for God, and we're gonna sing like children once again. And in that, you may not be perfect pitch, but baby, when you're in Jesus, you are perfect praise. I want you to stand up with me, if you would, here and over at, uh, at Portage as well. Now listen, we did not pass out palm branches, but everybody's got a palm. So lift up your palm and wave it and come on, say, say, Hosanna. Come on, say, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to save the world in a very strange way. It may be strange, but it's so beautiful. It's so powerful and it's so real. I want you to bow your heads with me if you would. Today, here's what I know is just as Jesus rode in to the city of Jerusalem, today, the Son of God enters into this moment. Jesus, resurrected Lord and Savior, is here by his Spirit. And in the same way that Jesus opened the blind eyes today, I know by his Spirit that all over this room and every other place where people are watching, the Spirit of God knows no time and no distance. He's awakening hearts. He's opening eyes of the heart. Is that you? He's opening eyes where it's, eyes of the heart are going, I see I see that Jesus is my only hope. I see that the enemy is with me and I need a savior to forgive me, to deliver me. And Jesus is the one who did that. Today, I need a savior. You see, Jesus enters in and today he picks people off of the floor that were lame and he says, today, follow me. Well, I don't know if I have the strength to do it. I'm not, I'm not a very good religious person. And Jesus is perfect. You're the right kind of disciple. Get up and follow me. Today, Jesus is taking some people that have maybe grown cold and hopeless, cynical. And today he's bringing us back to childlike faith and giving us a new song, song of praise. Today, Jesus rides into this moment, humble. He rides in and with him, he brings victory. With him, he brings salvation. Today, I don't know where you stand, but I know this, I know this, that the Holy Spirit is pulling on many people's hearts saying today, will you let Jesus become your savior? Will you let Jesus sit on the throne of your heart? Will you stop trying to do it yourself? Will you not become angry and cynical at the idea that you need a savior? Today, will you humble yourself and receive him and say, Hosanna? God, save me. Hosanna. Forgive me. Give me a new heart, a new life today. Hosanna. Everyone listening within the sound of my voice, even online, today if you say, I know I need a Savior. Today I know I'm a sinner. Today I can't earn my salvation, but I believe Jesus has paid for it. And I today want to receive Salvation in the name of Jesus. I want to invite Jesus into my heart, Hosanna, to be the Savior and the Lord of my life. Today, I know I'm not right with God, but today I want Jesus to come into my heart and to be my Savior. Pray for me, Pastor Lee. Wherever you're at, I want you right now, just raise your hand and say, that's me. Pray for me. Yes, 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 yes. Hands, just raise it and keep it up. This is not a shameful moment. This is a joyful moment. I see that hand, that hand all the way in the back. Over here to my right, I see, yes. Yes, yes, yes. On the aisle here, God bless you. Somebody in a corner. I, feel, I just feel like there's somebody in a corner of one of the rooms. You don't have your hand up, but you know you need to lift your hand. 
your heart's pounding and you haven't raised it right now, be free. Raise your hand. Be saved today. Hosanna. Thank you. All the way back there, I see that hand. You can put your hands down. Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead all of us in a prayer of invitation. The Bible says, if anybody believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross, and also believe that God raised him from the dead, and we confess him with our mouth as Lord, we will be saved. Salvation, victory will come to you this morning. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, I want everybody to pray this prayer out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, I come in the name of Jesus, and I say, Hosanna, save me, God. I believe in Jesus, that he's the Son of God, that he rose from the dead after dying on the cross for my sins. God, forgive me, cleanse me, give me a new heart. From this day forward, I repent. I turn my back on my past and serving myself. Today, I choose to follow Jesus and I surrender. Sit on the throne of my life and have your way. Thank you for loving me and saving me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's just celebrate.